Africa, open lands, steeped traditions, and wildlife. Living together in a delicate fabric. The rhino. Imagine for a second that it was all gone. Would you be affected? It's happening right now. We are right now in Sabi Sands, and this is the story of the rhinoceros. One rhino is poached every eight hours. With depleted populations in the wild, this entire species is approaching its tipping point. After roaming our Earth for 50 million years, there is a chance that the majestic rhino will be wiped from the planet by the 25th birthday of a baby born today. Already this year, 1,500 rhinos have been killed in this country. That is four every day. This is a story of hope. The story of the rhino. A story 500 million years in the making. It might be over unless we all become the hero of this story. When a rhino mother is poached, she lets out a sigh. It's indicative to her calf the danger is near, so the calf runs to its mother's side. Poachers kill it because they consider the calf a nuisance. If we are lucky, it escapes, but we only have 24 hours to locate it before its natural predators do. So essentially, we have lost two generations with each rhino poached. So how did we get here? It's about economics, a misinformed cultural belief, and the human greed for perceived social status. The rhino poaching crisis is not confined to Africa or Asia. It has reached our shores and threatens national security, political stability, and our social fabric. It is threatening our Earth, our children's heritage. A rhino's horn is not an aphrodisiac, nor is it a cure for cancer. The chemical makeup of a rhino horn is keratin, similar to your fingernail. Smugglers transport the horn across borders and sell it, worth more in its weight than gold and cocaine and human life. More often than not, smugglers who carry the horn across international borders kidnap children from adjunct villages. Once successfully across the border, the horn is delivered and the child is sold into the sex trade. Conservation beyond borders, a team of experts dedicated to resolving the wildlife-human conflict through empowerment and life-saving methods. CBB solves for the multifaceted rhino poaching crisis within its complexity. CBB talks to the poachers and smugglers themselves. The team educates about health risks and alternate livelihoods. Nicole, Conservation Beyond Borders is an organization and an idea whose time has come. The work we did together on the international wildlife trade, it was an eye-opener for many people here in India, but you knew, I knew, that as far as this trade, this awful trade is concerned, there's a revolving door between wildlife, the wildlife trade, the trade in human trafficking, the trade in arms as well. I met Nicole at the CITES COP17 uh, convention in Santon in 2016. At a brief meeting, she was the chief scientist for the Indian delegation, and it was clear to me that conservation beyond boundaries has a significant impact and is also a main driving force for new standards in conservation and research, both on a, a worldwide as well as a regional level. When a rhino is brutally attacked, a Conservation Beyond Border team is dispatched by helicopter to conduct a heart-stopping rescue operation. The goal, transport the rhino to a safe place to heal and nurse orphans left behind by these horrific acts. Uh, Nicole is a, is a good researcher and I'm pleased with it. Her cutting-edge research is innovative and more important, very feasible. There is so much negativity around rhino at the moment with the world poaching that to be involved in something like this is what lifts you and keeps you positive about things. How can you be a rhino hero? Join our journey to effectively save our wildlife, our earth. Let's face it, the legacy we want to leave for our children is in our hands. I don't think that it was 
and I will give them him to love me very much. All of the money we raise goes directly into the preservation of our most natural resources, wildlife. And with more than 60% of the biodiversity already gone, we can't wait. I tell you why. Because? They mean a lot to me. By saving rhinos, we save entire ecosystems. We save people. We save our morals. Thank you for becoming a wildlife ambassador. No one needs a rhino horn more than a rhino. If we can't save these animals, what can we save? That was a great introduction. I'm sure uh, all of us are very eager to hear uh, Nicole uh, expound on, on the work that she's doing. Um, Nicole is a wildlife biologist and director and founder of Conservation Beyond Borders, an organization that resolves human wildlife conflict across Africa and Asia. Nicole provides science-based strategies to international, national, and regional decision makers and applies economic theory to save endangered species in their habitat. Her research highlights the importance of local capacity building, as well as integrating indigenous people into the conservation process. Nicole applies game theory and Bayesian statistics to address rhino poaching concerns across Africa and, Asia and India, and has conducted research in South America, Southern Africa, West Africa, and India. Uh, she founded Cons Conservation Beyond Borders as a platform to provide conceptual and applicable solutions to transboundary conservation challenges. Uh, and, and as the father of a daughter who loves math, um, you're going to be a wonderful inspiration uh, to her. So uh, I'm going to hand over the microphone and uh, will please join me in welcoming uh, Nicole. different day and a different time. 
I did warn you that that's one of the issues that we deal with in South Africa. But really conservation success <coughs> is measured by the next generation. If we can make sure that the next generation is bred for and is born into a safe place, then the species will thrive. So I love the fact that I'm now talking in, this is St. Paul, right? Slash St. Paul, Minneapolis. And go around the world with me into a tour down to South Africa, which is home to both black rhinos and white rhinos. And the question that I most often get is how small is a rhino? So it's pretty small. I mean, it takes a lot of people to um, hold and move. So small slash huge and humongous, those are kind of the words that come to mind. Um, but they do live for about 35 to 40 years between the two species. A lot of people approach me and say, but why the rhino? We understand that you know, it's a mega fauna, it's beautiful, but why the rhino? So, I would just like to point out that for 50 million years, the rhino has roamed the earth. And it's soon to be destined to be extinct within my children's lives if we just do nothing. So all that needs to happen is for us to do nothing and this mega species will go extinct. Uh, in addition, the rhino does contribute economically wise and for capacity development and the way that it does that, it creates sustainable jobs and guaranteed income through tourism. On the personal side, they're quite curious creatures and their stress levels in the blood when we do the samples does indicate that they feel sadness, they feel stress, they feel loneliness. They have quite the character. The, the youngsters are pretty cute. In fact, when we do rescue uh, calves from mothers that were poached, we couple them up with goats. And the reason being is that we cannot always be with the little calf, but the goat stays with the little calf. So it does, does need that sort of bonding. Uh, they're quite foolish if you sit for a while in the savanna and look at them, just take your time. And they also recognize, care, and emotionally connect. They do remember people and relax, so they have that intelligence and capacity to remember the researchers that deal with them. But let me ask you this question, and I need you to kind of step into my world for a minute. So if conservation management is the real solution, so then what's the problem? And by that, I mean, are we, is that vehicle right there at that moment in time, a part of that leopard? Or when that vehicle leaves and the researchers go home, does the leopard live its life in complete isolation of people? And I would argue that not, not only are humans part of the ecosystem, actually that humans define the ecosystem. Uh, this is a slide that I came across the other day, and I, I found it quite interesting to my, make my point. That we are essentially domesticating the planet with all the livestock that we hold, especially South Africa, that is kind of converting to wildlife management from traditional agriculture fields. Uh, that is because diminished profitability from the agriculture field. So, in essence, our human footprint is growing and growing and growing each and every day. So what does that mean? That means essentially that not only are we modifying, that we also have to have a kind of a feedback system about the negativity that we are bringing. Researchers, in general, like to do good things, but humans are not only made out of researchers, there's a lot of illegal wildlife um, people and the market. So I'd just like to touch a little bit about what happens in the illegal wildlife. Tim mentioned that more and more species <coughs> are being listed every day. That's part of our effort to protect them. And we're protecting them against the illegal wildlife. The illegal wildlife trades in body parts of animals and also in plants. So how it works. Do I have a pointer in this thing or? Okay. Okay. So essentially, 
there's a demand, there's a supply, and then there's the, the, the reason for the demand. And if we look at it in a complete picture, we understand the global importance of this. So the demand happens in China and Vietnam, where the middle class uh, is growing and growing every day. The supply, of course, happens across Africa, and especially in South Africa because of their populations. And the illegal money that is generated from this market is then funneled back into the global um, situation. So the illegal market, if we can talk about that a little bit more and focus down about where we're actually discussing, the illegal money that circulated can go from 65,000 US dollars to 100,000 US dollars per kilogram, that's 2.2 pounds, uh, for rhino horn. So just think about that for a moment. That's a lot of money circulated on the black market. That's about 350,000 US dollars for one rhino horn on average. Needless to mention the fact that US dollars obviously get you a better rate in places like Botswana, like Uganda, like the Congo where the child soldiers are, and like the border between Pakistan and um, India where children are kidnapped from their villages in order to disguise the smugglers which cross the border. And the interesting about that is that they're not very worried about the health and well-being of the child. They're not even worried about how they dispense the child afterwards. It's the rhino horn that's, that's worth much more than the child. The demand for the rhino horn is out of the belief system. The whole illegal wildlife trade is out of the belief system. The belief system adheres to the, the fact that their logic says that by consuming a powerful and majestic animal, one resumes its potency. I mean, I had a chance to chat to a few folks before my talk and we chatted about the fact that different cultures believe in different um, medicinal purposes. Well, some work and some don't. So the pharmaceutical companies actually analyze the chemical component um, that consists of the rhino horn and its keratin. So it would be like me chewing my hair or chewing my nails. That is the same physical effect that rhino horn has. If we map it, and you know, it's the old saying, if you demand, supply will be created. The map goes around the world. And of course, the sources of the depleted populations are in, in South Africa or African countries. And the sad part about it is that it takes about 48 hours for a rhino horn to reach its illegal market in China or in Vietnam. And it can take about up to 48 hours uh, for a poached rhino to die of its wounds. So this is how it looks. This is a chart of supply. So in all of the economics and all of the business meetings, um, I, I, I'm assuming that your supply needs do not look like this chart. And this is the reality of the supply of corn. So if you stay with me and step into my world for a little bit, then you will um, get kind of a, a, a deeper understanding of what we're aiming at and how we address it. In the field, I meet a Sangoma. She is the witch doctor. There are no hospitals, there are no clinics, there are no doctors where I work. And so in Zululand, when a child is sick, they go to the witch doctor, the Singoma, she's very well respected. She tells me that she makes potions and drinks for the poachers to go out in full moon to poach for the rhino. And those drinks that she makes, make the poachers invisible. And they believe it. They honestly believe it. That's one hurdle that we're crossing. On the international level and on the research level, we're also facing challenges. It, there are always scarce data, limited resources, because we don't really have the time to wait for 20 years and collect the evidence and the data about the rhinos to kind of create our, um, I'd say, traditional statistics. And of course, there's always competing objectives of people that I talk to, and I always have to keep the possibility <coughs> and their need for economic profitability in mind. This is how it looks. It's a typical crime scene. They have closed it. Um, 
So first, we evacuate everybody from the scene and we address the animals. We collect data, we do the shooting trajectories, and by the way, in order to get the ballistics out of a dead rhino, we use a machete. So it's pretty, it's pretty harsh to look at, and I'm gonna go through these pictures really quickly, but the good thing is that low tech works. So out of this um, crime scene, we got a footprint or a shoe print, and we were successful in apprehending the poacher. In the same evening, I got this text, six guys were arrested by two police officers that went out into the village and they looked for the shoe of the person. Again, it's very low tech, but it's effective and it works. Uh, they found a silencer on the gun and they found the two horns that were removed, I would say. So sometimes low tech actually works. You don't have to go to those fancy social, meeting, uh, social media meetings in order to understand how to get to our clients. But if you would hang out with me just a little bit more and understand, try to follow the logic about how we implement the Bayesian statistics. So say there's a lot of media coverage about gender inequality. So there's two scenarios, there's the gender, there's the qualification for a certain job, and do you get hired? But if we start taking out the consideration of the gender, or we start taking out the consideration of the economics, and the fact that the poachers are disposable, and there are disposable force because they can get shot afterwards, the fact that uh, human lives depend on it, essentially we narrow down a model. So by deactivating links, in this situation, we create a new type of intervention. And that's in essence what the Bayesian statistic does. I apply this model to the variables um, in the field, really. And that is, that is the result. But what does it say? So it essentially says that in Kruger Park, which is, by the way, um, double the size of Israel, and Israel is always on the news, <laughs> and it is situated in the uh, border of South Africa. It's in, it's in South Africa. It borders with uh, uh, Zimbabwe and Mozambique. And this is kind of what we come up with in order to affect, to improve their um, way of control and saving the rights. The game theory is really simple, and I'm not going to talk about all the theories today because then that would be a little, that's a different talk together with my bathroom experiences with the snakes. But in essence, we talk to the poachers themselves. We do, we do community-based conservation. And how it happens is that the community really does care about the rhinos, but they do rent out their houses and their places to poachers that come from Mozambique. So in essence, if we can convince the South Africans that the rhino is their national heritage, it's their resource to, to use, we win because they can give us information. And so essentially what we do is we create this kind of safe environment. Um, I would just like to point out that these are bones found in the field, so obviously we did not kill any animal for that, and we did not take down any trees for that, but it is a learning experience. What we do is we associate the fact that if you touch wildlife, you're likely to get, for instance, zoonotic diseases, diseases that skip from wildlife to humans. If you talk to a woman in one of our workshops and explain that when she touches and prepares the meat of a kudu, she can contract anthrax, she's more likely to come on our side and give us inside information. In essence. Um, the very important first step is to model what they think about. So as a researcher based in Minnesota, I can't come in my perception. I have no right to come and say what South Africans should do, which is why we first gather information about their perception as to why. So why is it important and what variables are important to them. Uh, we do illustrate the Syngoma in a puppet show. So that's one of our guys, and that's the Syngoma, and that's somebody that's seeking advice from the Syngoma and from the witch doctor as to this person um, has some health issues, can the Syngoma help him? 
And then that is the wise hyena, because the hyena in the culture is considered to be the wisest animal. And the wise hyena explains that rhino horn does not work. It just doesn't. Uh, the pictures and the drawings are the drawings of the children. So we create the competition between the children, and they go home, and they create this buzz around, oh, no, you're not meant to poach rhinos. That's absolutely not a good thing. Uh, we optimize anti-poaching strategies with the rangers that protect them, so we give them some training. And then we do the communal pool resourcing. So the chief of a village will get a financial reward every month that a rhino is not poached. In turn, every month that a rhino is poached, they lose that financial reward. So the chief then reports to us about, at the end of the year, how did they spend that money. And it's pretty interesting. They spend the money on driving women for labor in the city. That's in the hospital, in other words. Um, we do really emphasize the fact that if that money is lost, you're <coughs> shamed in front of your whole village versus if you come on our side and we take care of your alternative livelihood and you join the rangers, for instance, uh, that kind of elevates your, your social status. In addition, this is a picture of uh, EPUB. That's what the UN distributes. It's kind of a compact uh, formula slash shape, which we use in America. And uh, the children love it, and it's very nutritious. So we do promise that the route comes through their villages, and that is a very big thing that it's a very big thing that we can convince them to join our side. But the law of probabilities really does always equal to one. In other words, if one event happens, another event cannot happen. So if poaching decimates an entire species, the northern white rhino, that means that Sudan is dead. Sudan is the last white rhino, uh, last male northern white rhino that lived in 24 hour care. And he passed away last year, on um, the 20th of March, and with him an entire species was dead. So we cannot have poaching plus expect that the species thrives. So what is it that we do? How do we actually make an impact? Well, first step is that we have to locate the rhino. And that's pretty tricky. And that's the real reason why I wanted to show the video. Thank you very much. Um, just to get a sense of the landscape and the dense bush sometimes that we work with. We place a, micro, a microchip and we scan it. So over here, oh, sorry, I don't have a pointer. But we're placing a microchip in the action horn and a microchip in the body of the rhino. So what happens is that first of all, we can monitor her, Nessie, we can monitor her uh, 24 hours. So if there's an event, if we get a breach of one of our fences, if the cameras pick up that there are poachers in the park, we know exactly where our rhinos are, and we deploy our anti-poaching units into that um, location. Sadly, if the rhinos would be poached, it's also a way to track the rhino park. So now you have a GPS system that corresponds you know, to the satellite in the horn, so that's another um, way. Thank God that we haven't needed to check that out yet, but that's our plan B. We also take blood at the same time for our uh, national database in South Africa that we're creating. And the last picture is just waking her up safely, giving her the antidote. The translocation issue, the whole idea behind that is translocate from high poaching areas, move them. So as soon as we dealt with the, with the villages that surround the park, we improved the anti-poaching um, rangers. We monitor the rhinos, and now we're moving the rhinos actually across borders, sometimes within Africa and sometimes internationally. So first step is always a model, of course. You should know that by now. Uh, second first step is practice. So what really happens is that essentially we are leaning off of a helicopter trying to shoot, shoot the hind of an animal that's moving. And of course the helicopter is moving and there's bushes and so on and so forth. Uh, it's another way to get respect uh, amongst the South Africans. So that is the situation.
situation in which we're darting from the helicopter of the rhinos. Once the rhino is darted, it is placed in a boma. Uh, it will stay in a boma for six weeks, and that's just to make sure that there's no diseases associated with it, everybody's healthy, the consul's strong enough to make the journey. And then we move them. This is a black rhino having a little nap. And this is a white rhino enjoying a little nap. <laughs> Another thing that we do do, the, third, the, the last uh, kind of big thing that we do is demoning. And I would like to take a few minutes to talk about the idea of demoning. After the fact that we did, I'm assuming we did establish the fact that humans are part of the biodiversity, of the ecosystem. So we can't really pretend like something's happening over there. And if we just move around some rhinos, it will work. So what we do is we remove the poaching incentive. If the, rhino, if the whole incentive of the rhino crisis is to poach the horns, let's remove the horns. Now, this image does indicate that there is no nerve endings in the horn. So it, essentially, it really doesn't hurt. I mean, I can't it, um, stress enough the fact that it's like clipping nails. We don't put the animal to sleep, we sedate it. So it does move some. It's still kind of awake, but it's in that zone and we remove it. And one of the key or the perceived disadvantages is that, okay, so you're now you dehorned a rhino and it's in the wild and its natural predators will get it because it has no way to defend itself um, against natural predators. Well, that's kind of an issue because the only natural predator that a grown or mature um, rhino has are humans. So lions will not attack it, hyenas will not attack it. They will attack calves that are newborns, but the calves don't have uh, horns anyway, so we don't horn them. So in essence, that, that the perceived fear is really not a concrete uh, issue. Another part is, as far as the, my, my genetist friends, is that they say, well, so you're breeding for genetic uh, superiority. So in other words, you know, it's not that it's the most, uh, uh, it's the strongest male that gets reproduced. Well, so my argument against that is mating is mating at this point of the, t uh, of the tipping point of the population. You cannot mate and produce an offspring if you're dead. So may as well, all of the genetic uh, diversity of the population can um, be shown in exhibit. Um, another thing that did come out in the modeling, which was relatively new, is that there is a need to, to dehorn entire populations. So what we do is we go into a park and over the course of three weeks we will dehorn the entire population and we do that every year and a half. So interestingly enough, I have to cut my kids' nails every three weeks in order to not think about what the teachers think about me at school. <laughs> And it's exactly the same thing over here. We have to cut every 18 months the rhino horn because it's big enough so it's still wet in the dark indicates to poachers that that's an animal uh, economically worth taking. So it's a... And they regrow. And they regrow. So the, the, the horn regrows to the point that every 18 months we have to dehorn that same rhino again. The process is very specific, so there's not a lot of wiggle room at all. It is measured. This female was actually dehorned for the second time. So we're measuring uh, how much has grown in order to understand if it's going to be effective or we can just leave her for a few more months. Uh, yes, the dehorning does take place with a chainsaw, but she's sedated. And you can see by her ear position that she is actually not in fear. And again, a dead rhino does not reproduce. So that's one of our big points. Um, we estimated what is the loss or the economic value of de the dehorning process itself, the, the chips that are left in the grass, and we weighed it, that was about 30,000 US dollars. So that is the, and I actually had some, uh, if you remember, Ken, I had some um, horn in my hair because we were so involved. 
and then the guy is reminding me to remove it because if somebody catches with me with it, it's illegal. So in other words, it's illegal to have it in your possession, it's illegal to touch it, it's just illegal. We buried um, this, by the way, we buried the horn shavings. Uh, we do apply antibiotics just to make sure that there's no infection. Although the likelihood is very low, we have not encountered one infected uh, animal. And then I think this picture really did touch my heart and it speaks for itself. Uh, it blew me away after a hard day's of work, which starts at 4.30 in the morning to try to locate the animal first. And then we take the horn off, we flip it over, and there's a perfect heart shape. And I wanted to post it, and then I thought, people won't believe me because it's just, it's just too perfect of a story. So it, it actually did happen. Um, and my whole talk today is about and leading to the realization that the rhinos do belong to South Africans. And the tourists are visitors, and for instance, in Kenya, dehorning is not allowed because tourists have said that they come to Africa and they want to take a picture of the rhino with its horn. But if we make all of our decisions based on ideas or belief systems or approaches like that, South Africa, South Africa in itself will lose all of its uh, natural resources as far as wildlife is concerned. This is a result of not doing anything. And the real question that needs to be asked is, do very, um, do ha does hands-on conservation have a place in 2019? In other words, do we actually have a right to handle these wild animals in the wild? Most of them have never seen people before, unless they're poachers and then it's too late. And then this is the result if we do nothing. So this was a uh, custom seas, and each and every horn over here represents one rhino. There are a few secondary horns there, but this is what we're up against, and this is what the world is up against. Uh, we, I would argue that strategic intervention is needed. We do do elephants monitoring as well. Uh, it may not be as, um, as pretty. I mean, we do put down the elephant, and it is asleep for a while, but then we wake her up, and then that's a, a satellite collar, just like we insert on the rhinos, a satellite uh, monitoring system. And that is done in order to ensure that this is the situation that tourists see. So when I go to Africa and my assistant is happy with the elephants, so then that makes me feel better. Um, this is what we're trying to avoid. This is a hard picture, I know. I have thought through the pictures and um, carefully chosen them, but... Um, South Africa has this gorgeous tree. It's uh, acacia. It has very different. It has multiple uh, subspecies to it. But the Zulu believe that the thorns are indicative of their way of life. And you will see that the thorns go, grows one like that and one like that. And the idea is that you can never go forward unless you fully understand your past. So in order to go into the future, we really do have to understand the present and the past. Now I know it's getting late in the talk, but I would just like to point out one last thing that we do, and one last thing that uh, the South African government has been a huge uh, support of ours and the Peace Talks as well, and that is that we help the injured animals themselves. As I said, it does take 48 hours for a rhino to die of its wounds. So if we locate that rhino in time, and if we find them, which is the bigger issue, we move them. So we find them in the bush, we rescue them either by helicopter, the, the previous picture, or by a car. We just put down the bench. And then we take them to the sanctuary, to the endangered species sanctuary uh, in the Popo, and they're taken care of. Um, this is the only picture that I had that's not very graphic. But Dr. Morris, he's on our team, and he really does uh, do the veterinary services. And for instance, a rhino like this will take 
four operations per year in order to have successful nasal and reconstructive face surgery. Um, we used to do it with plastic, and now we don't use plastic anymore, that's fiberglass, but it helps. And so the good successful story about that is that they are rehabilitated and they're moved and reintroduced into the wild. So these individuals were actually reintroduced into the wild. And then on behalf of my team I would, that are there every single day, I would love to say thank you for your attention and your willingness. Global Minnesota is amazing by the fact that they're bringing different um, countries into our awareness. And I'm just happy and grateful to be a part of raising awareness about the Majestic Rhino. And special thanks to my personal team that's always there to support me. So thank you. I can take the questions.